the entity right was to give a a, comp, a competitor to Google's DeepMind because it was just DeepMind was just ahead of the curve. Nobody was competing with it. There was no alternatives. No 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 defense against whatever they were trying to implement without any kind of regard or restriction for our safety. And so when you hear about him talk about his motives um, behind being involved with that, and then we see, you know, how it's played out recently, even, you know, he even talked about Ela and how uh, his relationship with what's his name? Uh, Ilya and, and how it ruined his relationship with the, with the Google CEO, Larry. Page. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. How it ruined their relationship. Exactly. Exactly. And then and then we look at it down the road, and it's like we still don't know what Ilya saw, right? What did Ilya see? So it's just those things, man, I find incredibly interesting. Once it hit the AI conversation, I was all ears. So, uh, yeah, I'm fired to kind of recount it. I've, I've been asked for a recap, so uh, I'm going to pull some clips while we're sitting here talking. Uh, if we want to go through the panel, I'll get some ready. Awesome. Yeah, in Tesla spaces recently, there's been talk about is – Elon going to try to recruit Ilya. Like maybe Ilya is not happy at OpenAI right now. I think that's obvious for anyone who's paying attention. Uh, whether or not Elon has a foot in the door and can try to get him into Tesla or XAI, I think that's interesting news. The fact that Elon brought that up, I mean, I know he was talking about the OpenAI history, but the fact that Ilya is on his mind right now uh, makes me wonder if there's maybe some truth behind that. What do you think, Adrian? Dude, give me a second, I'm like in a fucking dead zone, off-roading. Off-roading, multitasking, Adrian is always busy. Yeah, no problem, man, come back when you're ready. Uh, Michael, Ray, talk to me about what you thought about the space. Uh, you know, the beginning of it was kind of, uh, I think, I think uh, interesting, not, uh, not the most exciting stuff, but towards the end, I think when he started talking about regulation and deleting, you know, deleting or getting rid of laws, I thought that was... Uh, really key and imperative, um, you know, the multi-planetary stuff that he always mentions. But it's um, it's super interesting when you when you hear like he'll he'll throw in the little quirks like here and there, like he mentioned the uh, presidential race of 2032 and um, you know the transformers and fu diffusion thing. Um, it's it's just so interesting like where this technology is headed, and when you consider. It's it's like it's so exciting, but it's so freaking scary at the same time. And I, you know, it's I just think it's a really good thing that we have Elon Musk uh, doing what he's doing because I think where we were headed uh, was with with DeepMind and Google AI and, and all of that back back in the day um, was was not a good thing at all. But uh, I think he's righted the ship quite a bit. Yep, there's new competition in the space, right? And I think that's super healthy. Uh, while, let me take this opportunity to ask everyone, please hit the purple pill on the bottom right hand of your screen. Go in there, put your questions in the comments. Please hit the repost button, the quote post button. Tell your friends how great this space is. The more people we get in here, the better the discussion is gonna be. So thank you uh, so much with your help on that. Yvonne. Let's bring a female opinion into the discussion here. Talk to me about the space. What did you think? Hey, hey, hey. Yeah. Um, well, first of all, I, I freaking love Kathy Wood. She is the bomb. Um, I used to, I, fo I followed her on uh, MSNBC and stuff. And, and one of the things that really stuck with me for, with her specifically is, and which is what I was curious what they were going to discuss is she's mentioned in several interviews there. And that's before I knew so much about Tesla and Optimus and how Tesla is really more than just a car company. I don't think a lot of people really realize that because they only see it as a car company. And she was talking about how their estimate, every time it has a dip, she's always buying more of that stuff, which is freaking incredible because she knows that it's so much more, that it is like an AI technology company. It's not just a car company. She sees the vision beyond. I mean, one of the things that she had mentioned, or I, I think she mentioned the price, like that, you know, just the long-term effects of where Tesla is going to go, if people really know what it's all about. Um, and that's going to end up being at like $1,500 or $2,000 a share eventually down the road and everything with every, everything that they're doing. But I, I loved when he, I love the entrepreneur thing that he mentioned, because I personally, that resonated with me 
because I work with a lot of entrepreneurs. And one of the things I love all the AI stuff that they were talking about, of course, because in Adrian spaces, he is always doing incredible AI spaces. And Ossie, of course, you're always there and bringing Gary Marcus. And then we have Robert Scoble. Um, I love that he mentioned that the best, some of the best information on AI is being released on spaces and that we have a really incredible spaces on X. I freaking love that he did a shout out with that, which is awesome for all of us and um, just the collective consciousness in that, but showing that we are making a dent, we're being heard, we're being seen and things of like that. Um, and I, I love the, the entrepreneur thing that he said because that's kind of his MO. I mean, he's always said with Tesla, I didn't ever do it for the money. He's always about the innovation and what you're bringing. And I like how he kind of broke it down when he was talking about the money is basically just a reciprocation of the products and services that you are providing and kind of how people need to shift to think when you start a company or you're doing something like that, it's because it's something that you're passionate about and you really want to make a positive change in other people's lives with the product or the service that you are offering. It's not because you typically go, go into it for money. A lot of people start businesses and they go into it for money, not with that as their sole intention, instead of, in my opinion, which resonates why I love when he says things like that, because if you really are passionate about what you're doing and putting something out there and it really can be a huge positive change, you can't help yourself but start that company and do that thing. Because a lot of times when people entrepreneurs start that, it's because they themselves wanted to have that solution and they did not find it in the world. And that's something that I really love that he pound, uh, pounded home in a very simple way, as he always does. I love the the AI talk and just where things are going with that. And I, I love that they're doing more of these spaces and that they collaborated with that because, again, it's great for X overall with the platform. And then also for all of us who are continuing to create content. And then he just stressed again anyone who wants to gain any kind of traction on any kind of platform and especially this one it just needs to be entertained you need to be entertaining and provide information and um and keep it interesting and i i there are so many things but i don't want to hog like i i mean i'm sure there are more things that we could touch on but those are just some of the key components that i really appreciated when they started diving into that yeah, it sounds like we agreed on a lot of the same things. I think if you love your your solution that much, if you love your business that much, you can't be stopped. You don't need any encouragement. It's like, I must build this thing. I have reasons to build this thing. Uh, go ahead, Alex. Uh, Yvonne brought up money. First of all, great to be speaking again, Yvonne. Um, it, it's interesting the way he's flipped on cryptocurrency and, and blockchain technology over the last several years, because... He, he was, it seemed like he was very into it um, two or three years ago. There was a ton of Bitcoin on, on the Tesla books. He would tweet about Doge and, and a lot of different cryptocurrencies a lot. He seemed to be very, at one time, if people, as kind of a joke, he put like a bored ape as his profile picture, like uh, several months before he bought X. Uh, he was very much in the cryptocurrency culture uh, and, and seemed to be bullish on it. And He's first of all is, hasn't talked about it in forever. He was asked about it on this space, and he's like, "Well, what, what do you want to know?" Like, he, it seemed like he was not interested in the conversation whatsoever. And then no, he, he said, "Don't go to the moon." Well, yeah. that's because the SEC has like gone moon. after him hard, right? Yeah, what my bad. You, you broke up for me. What was that? I said it's because the SEC has gone after him hard anytime he yeah. talks about crypto, right? Because right? yeah. it, it fluctuates the markets too much. It's a good point, right? You know, they're not happy when he pumps stuff, but he doesn't even like seem interested in the technology itself. He seemed more interested in gold in that conversation than the blockchain. Like he didn't just he just didn't talk about blockchain technology whatsoever. I wonder. Um, I wonder if like he, he views crypto in some way as competition to future X payments. Uh, and, and if maybe that's why he's not talking about it as much. Another interest, I mean, he's always still wearing Do Dogecoin merch though, right? Like he's got Doge shirts on just about every time I see him. So I think he's still behind it. I had heard someone at some point say that there's like, he's not allowed to talk about Doge. Well, because uh, of, uh, of payment processing. He's like the king of payment processing from PayPal. So he, he knows what he's doing. He, well, right he now, Right now, they're in the middle of applying for licenses in all of the states to get grants for money processing. They they just got their first one seven days ago. It was in Pennsylvania. 
um, that they actually got their first money license so they could start doing transactions. So he's probably walking a very thin line when it goes to when it comes to that because he doesn't want to fuck that up. Also, too, his uh, two previous companies both have very easy crypto rails. So it's 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 very easy to see how I I personally think I just think the opposite I think he's 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 but just like you guys said he's laying low but it's definitely the future I don't see why he would not um, be implementing it at some sort certain point with that that crypto with the the integration into Twitter hex yeah he just I, mean, I think I think the exact quote he says I honestly just don't think about cryptocurrency at all he said and I don't know maybe he's being coy and laying low but he doesn't seem like the type of guy that ever is coy and lays low. Right. This is this is going to be the one time where he censors himself. I mean, there's still a lot to talk about when it comes to crypto, other than if prices are going up or down. You know, the whole well, concept of hard money is, is something he could have talked to. He just didn't seem interested in his defense. He's busier than he's ever been. Right. I mean, back when he was talking more about crypto, he didn't own X and X definitely takes probably an equal mind share that he was spending on crypto before. So I think it's like Elon just loves to be busy. He has to be solving problems constantly. And if he doesn't have enough problems to solve, then he'll think about crypto. And as soon as he does, as soon as he's working on his own payment system, he's got no room uh, to think about Bitcoin. That's my two cents. Go ahead, Adrian. Yeah, I mean, when he when he's uh, he's talking about crypto, I think he basically the Bitcoin Max. He's kind of ruined it for him. Do, do you know how weird those people are? It's like that's insane. You don't want to have anything to do with that whatsoever. And I think he's talking a lot about gold because essentially what Bitcoin is is a digital equivalent of gold, in a in a very literal extent. There's a lot of provenance behind it. It means a lot more. It's not like ETH. It's fucking garbage chain. It's like it's 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 just been ruined for him, I think. Because like, if you if you want to look at just mo money in general, where you could potentially store it, then you would want to, for instance, look for look look to Doge as a transactional thing. It's very good. Fees are low. It doesn't cost as much. But if you look at Bitcoin right now, for instance, the transactional fees are insanely high. There are problems with its systems. You get it's it's, it's very you, unstable still at this very moment Adrian? because there's stuff being done to it. What happened? Adrian, are you walking on a hamster wheel right now? Or like a car wash? It sounds like you're in a car wash. <laughs> oh, yeah, dude. I'm, I'm a... trying through rain right now. <laughs> oh, it must be the windshield wipers. It sounds like you're walking on a hamster wheel oh, yeah. powering yeah. your phone yeah. or something like that. <laughs> I mean, I've tried that. You uh, tried you on the, the, the space is over, bro. The space is over. Come out of the Tesla factory. It's all right. Yvonne, you had your hand raised. Go ahead. Oh, yeah. I wanted to touch on the crypto thing, too, although I know Adrian knows that stuff really well. I was just thinking in regards to that. I mean, who could blame him? There's so many things that are that he's being attacked in so many different directions for so many different things. Why would he want to? I mean, personally, if I were in his position, I wouldn't want to mention anything about that kind of stuff because I don't want any more crap being thrown at me. And, it, and crypto is, is still unregulated. It's such a hot mess. They're still trying to figure it out with all of that stuff. Like, I wouldn't touch that with a 10 foot pole because I just wouldn't want to deal with any of the flack with that. And, and the fiat system has been in place for so long and getting the, the banking system the way that he's working on doing that. Like, why would you even want to tap into that? Because it could cause more problems for him getting approval with what he's doing with rolling out with X payments. So I wanted to mention that and also mention another thing that he had said, which I think he said in a, another space or another interview a, a couple weeks ago or two weeks ago. It was about the regulations. I love that they kind of just started talking about that again because people with the news articles and some of the things that come out and how they print some of the FUD or they only per, per, like print the 1% of the particular topic regarding that. You know how they do, you guys, like with the MSM and they're always like taking one little section of the context of whatever it is. He's not following with the regulations and he's always pushing back on regulations and all this kind of stuff that they do. When meanwhile, and I love just love that he pound that home because I think that this is something that not a lot of the people in the public know because they unfortunately aren't on X enough, which is part of the wave. I'm hoping that we are helping to shift because I know I'm promoting X all the time on my own just because it's such an incredible platform of information and exchange of that for people to be able to have information like that so they can have the full context that 99, like he said, what 99% of the time, 99.9% .9 of the time with all of his companies, and especially with publicly traded companies, when you have to have your quarterlies and you have investors, there are so many tight regulations that have to be followed 
when you have to do that stuff that if you're doing that 99.9% .9 of the time, like he said, but maybe you're pushing back on a couple of particular things. And I just think it's ridiculous how they're always focusing on the negative crap that they do because they just want to kind of like bash him or have some kind of negative press out about him. People, but when you get to the uh, statistics, that's when it's a beautiful thing because the numbers don't lie, right? People love to beat up on Elon. And you brought up a, a, another funny, interesting point, right? Like he was sure hating on going public during this. And I think it's exactly because of what you're talking about. It's like he just gets attacked and attacked and attacked. And if you're a public company, that's an attack vector, right? You attack the company, you're attacking the person's wealth. That's awful. If it's a private company, that's a much, much, much harder thing to do. In terms of staying out of cryptocurrency because it's messy, I mean, he talks about the Israel-Palestine conflict and Ukraine-Russia conflict. I think that those are much messier than cryptocurrency. I think maybe he's just picking his battles here. I really do think it's a matter of time. Uh, one thing that he said recently about the crypto or, or rather the fiat money system was he mentioned that it was like the biggest scam that no one realizes is a scam. I forget whose post it was, but it was something uh, along those lines. Go ahead, Malcolm. I was going to send it uh, to you anyway. And I see you got a hot mic. What's going on, man? What's your Yeah. Sorry. Sorry. The mic is, uh, yeah, there's stuff on right now but no no i was about to say what are you talking about the cryptocurrency is a massive global world war man like it that is literally one of the messiest conflicts you could ever get involved in the crypto wars but uh no no it's like i said elon musk is a very forward-thinking guy i think that his idea on you know ai um you know just looking towards the future i think it's par for the course when you have a guy like him and you know that, that kind of goes back to the whole idea with uh, Grok or uh, Grok. I've never quite figured out how to pronounce it is that, you know, you don't want to be behind an AI arms race. Either you find a way to get a handle on AI, learn how to use it and proliferate. And, you know, again, learn to responsibly exist with it or it will rule you. And when it rules you, <laughs> it's going to, you know, it's not going to be a good outcome. And by ruling, you know, just kind of expound on that. I don't mean rule you as in the AI is going to tell you to do this, although it kind of does depending on your view on algorithms. But by rule you, I mean that the AI will essentially replace a lot of our ability to do essential functions and we'll be left holding the bag in a situation where, okay, we have this AI and, you know, again, we we've forgotten these skills because we've always relied on AI for these, uh, you know, for these functions. And, oh, well, lo and behold, uh, if the AI gets cut off or if you get banned from it or somebody monopolizes the access to the AI, OK, well, we're kind of screwed. And you see everybody's kind of working that way. And it's just like his view with, you know, again, Tesla, it not being necessarily just an electric, um, you know, just a cars company, but I mean, it's literally a wave to the future, uh, especially just uh, with some of the technology that they're working on with the uh, batteries and whatnot. I think we do need to sort of get away from cobalt and, you know, we, again, it's just everything about this guy is, it sounds a little bit too good to be true sometimes, but you know, he, he's definitely paving the way for the future and he's got the means and at least the mindset to do so so again gonna be a fun time interesting the, well he's the, actually go ahead go ahead uh, okay. well i was just gonna say real quick you know he's he's kind of they brought this up too is he's democratizing the leverage with ai by giving us all equal access to like grok and then in the same in the, on the same note he was he was referencing grok with x as if it's all one collective hive mind right that's going to be that's going to be operating like striving towards truth collectively and i really do feel like that's his ultimate vision when he sees x when he sees grok the potential of artificial intelligence it's that you know he talked about how there was going to be this this war for the truth right this this uh this this arms race for truth uh, coupled with artificial intelligence. And, and I really feel like that's at, what's at the core of, of, of where we're heading with this, or at least that's what he's trying to get. And he's trying to let us all, you know, play our part in that instead of having it be a, a selective system where only certain people get access. X is providing a platform where we all kind of have this launch pad, so to speak, um, or at least an opportunity to use that access 
to do something with. And I think that's great. Is anyone else even competing with X in terms of the platform for truth right now? I mean, between community notes uh, and and just generally the the mission of free speech, I'm not sure that there's anyone else out there that's even giving it a shot. So good thing. Good thing we got X to take care of us here for sure. Hey, Alex, uh, let me get one of those space resets that you're famous for. Let's sell something here. Let's sell something here. What is going on, crew? All 519 people in here. Let's do a little space reset. You guys just heard Elon Musk and Kathy Wood uh, have an unbelievable conversation about the future of humanity. We're going to the moon. We're going to Mars. You are now tuned in to the biggest uh, after space on this platform. There's no other space you want to be in breaking down the Kathy Wood Elon Musk conversation. I'm going to need everyone here to do a few things. First of all, you need to go in that purple pill. Ask any questions if you want. We have a huge team of expert opinions and tastemakers on this stage right now ready to answer those questions. Go in there. Ask your questions. Also, feel free to share this space out. We want your friends in here. You get your friends in here. Then you come on stage. Then you get views and likes and followers. Everyone wins. Share out the space. Keep it tuned. We're going to share uh, some major alpha. This is the only place on the internet in the metaverse you want to be right now. Penny, right back to you. Love you, Ford. I think you forgot to say hit the repost button. I oh. only got comments. So re- oh. No, I said hit the repost button. I said hit the repost button. I said share it out to your friends and get in here so you all can get more followers. I touched on that, Penny. We need you to pay closer attention to my shout out. I actually even heard him say that if we get to 150 reposts, that Penny is going to do the space nude. Oh, my God. If we get to 200 reposts, me and Penny will make out and uh, post the video. I'm in. I'm in. Let's do it, Alex. 300 repos guys it's locked in so uh yeah don't back out don't don't try to move it up 300 because i'm not don't... backing out only penny would back out we're about to crush that total like the first nothing. first um 10 minutes of announcing it so get ready guys strap in y'all share it out we need this action not really but still i see jim's trying to come off the mic I want to welcome jim up to the stage jim what are your thoughts brother yeah, first of all, before I give my thoughts, uh, so this means there will be two videos, Alex, because uh, Penny does things twice, right? That's, hey, if i got to do it twice. i got to do it twice, man. I'll yeah. do anything for a retweet. There you go. Hey, by the way, so, yeah, it's a great space and great interesting comments. It is interesting how Elon doesn't quite put himself out there on the uh, crypto and blockchain stuff. And and I do wonder if it has to do with SEC compliance issues since they're holding so much Bitcoin and Tesla. I'm not sure what it is, but it, it always seems a little bit odd. But as anyone looking at my profile can check, I'm out there every day advocating uh, for blockchain, particularly trying to get the legislation right in D.C. But um, I found the space very interesting because, you know, this, everything that's happening in AI right now <clears throat> is radically transforming what's what people are doing day to day. It's it quickly starting to seep into the culture, combined with the fact that you've just had these massive run ups. I'm looking at coin market cap right now. and Bitcoin is just under forty four thousand. It was over forty four thousand earlier in the day. That's starting to pique people's interest right now. And, and you're starting to see a swell back into what's going on in the space after the massive uh, downturn after the 61,000 level was reached uh, a couple of years ago. So so I but but that that's what makes it really interesting that 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 Elon was not quite really grabbing on. He wasn't negative, but he wasn't jumping in there. And, and from my perspective, I see blockchain and Web3 as the next major technology advancement within the next 10 years or so that, that we're, we have seen since Web 2 and, and before that since the Industrial Revolution. I'm, I'm, I mean, I'm all in on that, and I think it's really exciting. Didn't, didn't Focus get switched from blockchain to AI in 2023? I thought that was like the theme of 2023. We, we forgot about blockchain and, and we remembered AI. Am I wrong about that? Well, you know, there's. I think there's some truth to that. I think 
chat GPT kind of blew that open. But but people are also beginning to realize that AI is not the answer to everything. They're, they're beginning to implement it. It's certainly part of the whole process. But you're, you're beginning to see uh, AI connections into the blockchain space. That's beginning to develop itself. And, and there still is like AI is not going to be able to accomplish technologically what blockchain is going to be able to. It's going to be the, the advancements in the medical field, in supply chains, and many, many other areas of the economy, and then new things that are going to be coming in. in you know, like, you know, the, the whole finance end of blockchain is still developing the self-finance capabilities. And, and that's kind of been changing. And, and the regulatory environment actually has been slowing that down. But once that actually gets moving forward too, you know, it's, it's all going to be concurrently moving highly forward, AI and blockchain, in my humble opinion. Well, I think I think AI is going to integrate with everything, and and I kind of chuckle when you say it's not the solution to everything because my attitude is with the right uh, developers working on it and applying it to a problem. Uh, if we can solve it as humans, we can probably solve it with AI. I do think that probably blockchain is a tool that AI leverages, and maybe even it rewrites uh, its own blockchain technology when it becomes the super ultra programmer that I expect. AI to be in the next couple of years. Maybe it makes all of these other blockchains obsolete. Uh, we'll see how that goes. Honey Badger, I want to hear your take on the space. Well, hey, I just got here, but thank you so much, Penny. But yeah, um, that actually kind of tickled my ears too. How can we possibly know whether or not AI is the answer to everything or not? I have, Every day I learn something new about AI and its capability that I did not know. And so, I mean, Jim, I, I don't mean any, I, I don't mean to be harsh, but essentially, you know, the, the only thing that we can do, like any person who wants to survive and thrive moving forward is at least make friends with it, play with it every day, you know, like push it to its limits, try to find everything you possibly can. My friend, um, I, I thought he was in here, but um, divisive, uh, divisive content, you know, actually creates, um, creates AIs and so this is just like one like one kish thing that nobody ever thought about I don't think but like so for example homeschooling you can a, a, a parent can literally go in and create a teaching model for you know that is not uh, how do you put it that is not um, I based on ideology to whereas you know whatever they'd be learning in school would be so they can actually put you know put in so you can actually put in yes so let's say you're a Christian parents um, that are like, you know, anti-communism or like, I mean, just, you know, with, with the slant of, um, real history and, uh, you know, math taught in, in a certain sort of a way, accounting, whatever it is, you know, that you want your child to learn, you can put in and you can put that in and it'll give you exactly, it'll filter out the things that you perhaps don't want your, your, your child to be indoctrinated in, you know. Parental controls on AI yes. is something that I hadn't thought about, but it obviously makes sense. We apply parental controls to the phones, to YouTube, you know, whatever. If you're a parent, you know all about parental yep. controls. Uh, and so, it's, and so it's like, you want one, more thing, one more thing, it, if I can it add rhymes. it. The other really cool thing yeah, is that yeah, you can ahead. add, so that the parents get a transcript of every moment of, you know, of the instruction and teaching. So they get an entire transcript of, of all of the interactions. Um, after you know after they're done so they can see like so let's say it's a 12 year old that's learning at home and they're out getting groceries they can find you know they can they get a whole transcript of everything that their their children are being taught so I think that's that feels incredible. like if I mean on one hand as a parent I listen to that and I think how cool I can make sure that my kid's not getting into any trouble and on the other hand it feels a bit like a, a nanny state right and it feels like if that tool exists for parents then it's going to exist for governments as well and and I'm not so sure that I like that level of surveillance being applied just in general right to kids uh, or myself it's like it's the question of do you put a, a location tracker on your kid do you put sp uh, spy cams in your house you know like well, I, I guess what I I'm know. saying is is that you know just again as a as a parent you know I've already raised my child but 
but it's just impossible at this point for parents to really know what's going on in their education. So we're talking about minors, right? We're not talking about like, you know, like 19 year olds where they need to really be considering things for themselves. We're talking about children, you know, and, and if you guys have been following, you know, a lot of the stuff that happens in the web and, you know, how, you know, even kids are like, the, like, especially young men that go in certain spaces and they're literally being tracked by the FBI already. So I guess what I'm, I'm saying is just from a parental standpoint, you know, you can't have too many eyes on what on the, on what your children are doing during the day when they're supposed to be learning, you know, especially on the web. So, but again, that's just one possibility. But it, but but like it, that would have like you said, Penny, that would have to be expanded upon. That you know, people would have to say, okay, to themselves, you know, am I trying to shroud my kid from from the you know the truth of of the world? No, you know, there there ought to be current like a current events. You know, so for example, like a, like a, a current events or like happening in the news and, you know, controversial subjects so they can get to that critical thinking level. It just doesn't, but these, you know, such things, especially there are certain topics that, you know, a child's mind isn't developed enough to be able to manage on their own that are getting shoved in their faces otherwise, you know, you know, um, you know, in public school. So to be able to like present information to your child as it's age appropriate. And by that, I mean like biologically and physiologically appropriate for, for where they're at in their, you know, developmental stage is something that's going to be able to built it to be built in. And so all I can, all I can really say is that, you know, the more that we make friends with AI, the better off we all will be. Because again, the pop, the, you know, it is only limited by our ability to be creative. I agree. I think there's there's infinite ways that we can apply AI just to tutoring people, right? And and the parental filters is just one way that you can apply it. But there's so many ways that we can utilize AI for learning. Uh, Chris, you've been patiently waiting. What do you got for the space? Yeah, um, you know, I hope everybody's doing well. Um, you know, but uh, I, I, to build on the conversation, uh, people have been paying attention, you know, in, in 2019, um, you know, Elon at the WAIC uh, talked with Ma, um, you know, and it, we, I think everything that we've seen is really like the tip of the iceberg. Because um, when people say that um, that AI, you know, is not the future and, you know, instead of these other technologies are the future, you know, I, I have trouble believing that simply because like uh, if, if you look uh, and if you really look between the lines, there's many applications that haven't even been explored yet. Um, and in fact, if you've been listening to Elon Musk speak, um, you know, at some of the summits and at, uh, you know, WAIC, just to give another example throughout the years, you've seen the evolution um, because it, it started in China um, with, I mean, Optimus, that is, um, you know, with uh, leaking in the Shanghai showroom. Um, you know, and, 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 you know, it's a process of getting individuals to become more active than passive. And I think this is another topic that they covered on today's spaces is, um, you know, not necessarily diving into the financial aspects, but purely speaking about a call to action. Um, you know, a quote that particularly stuck with me throughout, um, you know, throughout the spaces is keeping that dimly lit um, spark of consciousness in a vast, um, you know, universe of darkness right and he hinted at some of the aspects of um you know how ai and uh, some of his companies could play a future role um you know he, he he didn't necessarily delve into you know the applications of optimus but he did say that starlink is the key to um you know making humanity an interplanetary species um and you know today is the eight year anniversary um, you know, the first time that the Falcon orbital class rocket landed. And since then, there's been over 250 launches and counting. And, you know, another thing that's been happening behind the scenes, if people have been paying attention, is um, Elon is, you know, very much pro-humanity. And he's very much the type of individual to introduce a new model when the current model isn't working, Right. So if you have, uh, if you if you need humanity to continue to create more humanity, um, and that simply isn't the case um, with the trends, you need to introduce a new model um, to help humanity free up a lot of time so they can start focusing on some of the more important topics, like some of the topics we discuss on spaces. 
such as AI, et cetera. Um, and I really think that, um, you know, SpaceX, Starlink, um, even Neuralink, because some of the applications between Neuralink, um, they can even be applied with artificial intelligence and restoring limbs to amputees and individuals that lost limbs. You know, Elon even created Chris, this Chris, himself. Was it, was it the first time that we had heard that that that, that logo on the Starlink was like the, the map uh, for the communication between Mars and Earth, had we has he ever said anything like that before that you had heard or anyone else on this stage? I felt like that was no, me. no. It's so fascinating, you know. Especially um, being the pioneer he is, he always needs to set himself in those positions, you know. And and the call to action stuck with me. Um, getting people to become more active and actually look aside from the financial aspects. And look at what the actual stock of Tesla, the companies, the businesses that he's developed stand for and what they represent for the future of humanity. Yep. Um, you know, he also said, uh, you know, it's important for humani uh, humanity to become an interplanetary species, uh, you know, and if there ever was a multi-planet civilization on the moon or Mars, it would become autonomous. And I think what he's hinting at here is for people to do research, to delve into it and, and truly learn about what is happening here instead of being distracted by all the unnecessary things like wait um, you guys wait real quick for, for, ahead, for you get too far into it just uh, you so you're telling me because i missed that during that last space he referenced the logo as a map between the two planets is that what i heard you say correctly yeah, he did. He mentioned, I don't know, he said it was like on the back of the Starlink unit. I don't know if he specifically said it was the logo, but there's like an etching uh, somewhere on the Starlink unit that is like the communication map between Earth and Mars, which I thought was just a fascinating uh, bit of information. Yeah, yeah that's like, correct. It was, not the the it was not the logo. It was, it was on the back of the device, he said. Okay, so like on the home unit, on the home unit, there's an etching of the map to Mars. That's that's crazy to me. Yeah, that's pretty wild. I thought that was a super cool point as well. Thanks for bringing that up, Chris. Uh, let's go to relax. Asia, Asia had her hand up, but she like started to talk but stopped. Yep. All right, Asia first, and then you, we'll go to relax. You can you can go around because it's probably better if I just take questions. Um, I have pretty specific stuff about AI. Cool, cool. All right. Well, uh, I think we had some questions maybe from the chat. Let's go through some of the chat questions that Marge had looked up. If you want your question brought up and you haven't been approved as a speaker, get down into the purple pill, add your questions to the chat. Marge is going through there and in our back channel, she's posting the best questions. Hit that repost button while you're in there. Let's get as many people in this space yeah, 500 people and less than 100 reposts is unacceptable. So if you can, just take a moment, go down in the bottom right corner, hit the repost button, support your independent journalists and creators on X. That's how you do it. Thank you. That's right. Thank you, Diligent. It, you know, if we get enough of these, remember, Alex and I are going to make out and post a video. I got a sneaky feeling that that could beat my face reveal video. I got 8 million views on my face reveal. I think if I made out with Alex, it would probably do more than 8 million views. Uh, who came up with that idea? You or Alex, just so for posterity, who came up with that idea? I, I will own it. I, I came up with it. Uh, there's going to be a lot of political accounts that follow us, Penny, that are going to hate that video, who will openly shame it. And that, that'll probably get us a good amount of the Graphic. Page, So I actually like the idea. <laughs> I, I need more haters for sure. And and I, I got to think that there's going to be a lot of quote tweets on that one with some hate. Uh, I'm here for it. Uh. I'll, uh, I'll give you a, I'll give you a lesson on how to gain haters sometime soon, Penny. I got plenty of them. Oh, right. so are you going to go haters? back to, are you going to go to bit? I was just about to say, uh, are, are you going to run a hater loaning agency? Why I might do that. If I can sell off my haters and, and lend them out to other people, any way I can monetize my haters, I'm going to do it for sure. Mo monetize your haters. That's such a great line. I think I heard Ian Miles Chong say that first. Monetize your haters. I love it. Uh, let's go to Dan real quick. I don't know how long Dan's going to be able to be with us, but I love having Dan in any space. What do you got to add on the on the Elon Musk, Kathy Wood space, Dan? Did you listen? Sorry, relax. So, you're, you next. You're, you're not that special. Yeah, sorry to cut relax off. Um, relax, relax. Suck my um, dick. <laughs> um, I actually. Oh, that's not very relaxed at all. Oh, man. Yeah, yeah, bitch, relax, bitch, relax. 
Remember that? I like that. That was nice and concise. Usually relax will ramble on for like five minutes about how frustrated he is with your comment. That was just a quick suck it. You know, I love that. Yeah, yeah. No, that, that was actually well well placed. Good timing. I, I appreciate it. Um, I don't have a lot to add because I you know have a, a job and I wasn't able to attend most of the space. I caught a couple of glimpses of it, but uh, I was I was hoping to hear more from you guys. But I did want to comment on what Honey Badger said. Um, I like the idea of using AI to help create, you know, a, like a lesson plan for your kids. I don't personally homeschool, so uh, caveat emptor, but I, I don't love the idea of just sitting your kid in front of AI for a long period of time. I think, I, they call me old fashioned, but I think people learn from people and I think that's critical. So I, I'm actually not a huge fan of that per se. And then you guys have all probably watched Black Mirror, but there's one episode where, you know, in the beginning of it, they implant like this device inside of a, of a girl who gets like, I think she falls out of her crib and the mom gets upset. So they have this technology and like, it just shows you like over the course of the episode, like how it's a slippery slope as a parent wanting to control your child, both seeing what's going on and even controlling what they can hear and see. And if you haven't seen that episode, I highly encourage it. I'll try to find it and share with you guys. Yeah, I kind of want to piggyback awesome. off of that. I kind of want to piggyback off of that and ask the questions like, um, if if you want to like basically use AI as a means to censor an experience for your children, you're really taking you're really you're not taking into consideration the concept of you being the exact same thing that you would like to see eliminated from the world, which is an overbearing force that makes decisions on your behalf without your consent, right? So like that's another little aspect. As for the copying off of people. I mean, we're just symmetry engines, which means we just basically take in a lot of information that we output it at a amplified rate, because that's basically what we are. We just use our life energies essentially as a means to basically uh, turn information into action, vice versa. So, like, you can learn off of people, but you can also learn off of books. If the AI is really good, then I see no reason uh, as to not using it. Perhaps, like, I, I would say, I would, I would say, read out of a book first, and then sit up in front of an AI when they're like 18. Or, or something along those lines, because otherwise they don't have the problem-solving structure that many adults uh, have. It's, it's, it's also an, an attention span problem. That's another thing, because you always want the quick hit. You always want the quick result of information. And so what if they prompt the AI to do exactly that, which is also why TikTok is fucking garbage. It's like it basically cooks your brain and just remo like shortens and, and, and really condenses your attention span such that you cannot actually ever perceive anything complex about the world. So I think AI is good. Just it depends on when. I, I, I tend to agree with a lot of what you said, Adrian. I, it makes me think of in the back of the book, they sometimes will give the answers to the odd questions and you have to solve the even ones on your own. And I always found like the even problems really tested my understanding. Like if you, if you could resolve, if you could resort to the answer in the back of the book, you tended to do that quickly. Uh, you know, you, you give up quickly and just, I'll go look at the answer and see if I got it right or not. But if you have to work it out and there's no answer in the back and you even have to find ways to prove to yourself that it's correct, and those are the even answered problems, um, then that really tests your learning. And I feel like AI, it's got a lot of great things going for it, but giving it to your kid where it like has all the answers in the back of the book, I think some dangers come yeah. with that. Yeah. I mean, it's because I mean, it never worked for any of the answers. Atrophied, right? Okay. I mean, because when we stop using, when we stop using these muscles that we're gifted with, and let AI or machinery take over, then then we lose that kind of development that we've acquired over however many thousands yeah. of years. Correct, and that I when when does that when when do, when do we like apply that right? Because you could say the same about using a calculator, but I think what we end up doing is we just abstract math another la level, yeah. and we're able to accomplish bigger versions of similar problems as a result of using that calculator. I'm hopeful that we can do the same with AI, but there may became a point where AI is just so good it doesn't even need us to help control it. It doesn't need us to abstract the situation. Well, oh, and by the way, well, don't forget Penny, the, you... the, the progression there because we went from the slide rule to the calculator, you know, and well, I mean, and... if you look at the calculator element, it's not about the, it's not about the answer. It's about the outcome uh, through what you're able to do with after. Okay. So if you look at it in terms of exercise, 
the reason why you learn math is not necessarily in order for you to navigate the world in a sense where I'm just going to solve number problems, but you're solving equation-based problems. You are supposed to internalize a problem-solving structure that is an equation and its subsequent answer, which is also an output, in order to make better decisions and in order to be logical and not a weird, unmanaged mess of hormones. <laughs> so, like, that, that's really the biggest problem. And that's why calculators are seen as something that is destructive. Yeah. Because initially what the brain is supposed to do is supposed to exercise those specific parts of it, such as, like, learning a language, right? You just learn the language of the universe and how your brain can make sense of it. Like, for instance, you can't make sense of uh, infinity, but you can write a little symbol there that acts as a means to represent infinity, such that your limited brain can now understand something that is literally infinite. So that's pretty cool. So I think that's what math think is about really it at for. scale. Think, think about it at scale, too, what Penny was saying. He's like, yeah, well, you can build on the use of the calculator to go even further. But if you look at what's happened is that fewer and fewer people are doing that. So, yeah, yeah, a fewer selection of people do build on, build on with the calculator. But at scale, the general population actually reduces it. And if you need an example, look at the telephone numbers. How many of you can remember telephone numbers of the people that you get numbers for? None. No one. No one can do it. We don't hard need hard to. Hard. Exactly. Exactly. We don't need to. So you're no longer exercising yeah, that function of your memory. So you're no longer yeah, exercising that problem. function of your memory. That's a problem. Mm -hmm. That's a problem, though. But, right? but, like, but I, can't I would argue all the phone numbers because if I if I'm stranded somewhere, I could just go to a fucking phone booth if they still exist, and I type it in there because I I need to be reachable to a certain they, extent because I do a lot of important exist. shit. So, they don't exist. Yeah, I've seen a phone. Well, they still do for now. Go, go ahead, Malcolm, please. Uh, yeah, go ahead, Malcolm, and then I want to send it to Relax. I promised him a long time. And nah. After Relax, after Relax, real quick, Malcolm, after Relax, we're going to send it to Carolyn, who has a awesome post in our Jumbotron right now. She got a three-line reply from Elon. So we're going to go to Rel Malcolm and then Relax, and then we'll go to Carolyn. Go ahead, Malcolm. Yeah. I mean, for the most part, again, I like the idea of the calculator analogy, although I think when it comes to the calculator, it's sort of an intensification of the point, um, you know, largely because a calculator is kind of a point A to point Z, but you still have to figure out all the letters that come in between it. With AI, it's a whole other beast because it literally goes through the process. If you were to ask, and you know, if you were to, uh, let's say, put something in a math solver, it's going to give you the answer, but you still have to figure out how it got the answer unless you pay for the premium version go to the AI is literally going to break down the uh, problem, all the different permutations of solving it. And, and therefore it's going to literally render you being able to think obsolete. And so I do just want to uh, include that little distinction there. Yeah. The, the Wally -E scenario where we don't, we just get fat and don't do anything anymore is definitely frightening. Go ahead. Relax. Relax. Are you no longer with us? All right, we'll go All to that complaining, then. and he just he just ignores that guy you. is the king of engagement farming on stages. He's he's a close friend of mine here, but sometimes he needs a kick in the ass, and this is one of those times. All right, well, we know who to cycle first if we have more requests, March. No, it's okay. I already cycled these. Down. Yeah. All right, all right, Carolyn. Let's talk about your post in the jumbotron. Hey. Um. So I got a reply from Elon last night. I know everybody has obviously heard about Ashley St. Clair's reporting on this whole migrant situation. And Elon had responded to somebody's tweet talking about how someone from Congress had told him that this is all intentional. It's to skew um, the voting left. And um, so I responded and I got a pretty substantial reply, which was surprising. Um, it's, it feels really cool. I think like Twitter X, sorry, um, that is the only place where stuff like this can happen. Um, and I think that is what, that's why we love um, X and being in these spaces, just the access that we have uh, to a caliber of person that like you would never have access to on Instagram, on Facebook, anywhere else. Um, so that was, that was a cool moment. And then Vivek uh, weighed in this morning. So woke up with my coffee and uh, Elon and Vivek replies. So that was fun. Is this, Is this your first interaction? 
Is this your first interaction from Elon? It's not. Um, I had one reply from him. I think it was just like a one word reply. Um, one of the Krasensteins had said some had made a post about um, features on X and I had like a pretty long form reply with some suggestions and I think he responded absolutely uh, to that tweet but this is the first like substantial response that I've gotten from him so pretty cool that's next level well congratulations go, go ahead Adrian sorry I didn't see you lit up oh I just said that's next level but remember first rule of Elon Club you don't talk about Elon Club <laughs> Yeah, uh, Penny's not very good about not talking about Fight Club. He's not good with those rules, so you might want to tell that to somebody else. What is Fight Club? <laughs> Never heard of it. Nothing nothing is off limits when MySpace uh, is in action. When I'm the host, we talk about everything. I got no fear. Uh, that's what I'm here for, right? We're here to talk about important things, like who got Elon replies. Uh <laughs> It's kind of funny because uh, Alex. we have a very large Alex. collection of people that have gotten it. <laughs> even even I have. It's kind of like a self-sorting sample, isn't it, right now? Well, I think those of us who are like ultra super active on X are both interested in similar topics uh, and also most likely to get engagement, right? We build our own followings and, and that drags Elon into discussions. So definitely a bit of that. Alex, you've been way too quiet in this space. You're like one of the most dynamic hosts and speakers on this platform and I want to get you involved. So please throw in your two cents, maybe do a room room reset, maybe give an opinion. I don't really care what it is, but unmute and talk, please. I had to throw a two slices of salmon into the oven. This is dinner time. If I do not make me and my girlfriend dinner, she is not going to talk to me tonight. So I had to get that in the oven. Uh, room reset. We are, uh, we are talking about the Elon conversation with Kathy Wood. We're going in a lot of different directions. We have Caroline on stage. You got a three line, not a two line, not a four line, a three line reply uh, from Elon Musk earlier. Every line from Elon boosts your algorithm just a little bit. So that three lines, a powerful hit right there, Caroline. Congratulations to you. Shout out to you. Uh, as congratulations for Caroline getting that three line reply. I'm going to need everyone here to retweet this space three times. Uh, get into that purple pill in the bottom right. Hit the retweet button. Uh, give us your questions. Do we want to run through a couple quick questions um, from the comments since we've been uh, goading people into doing that? Absolutely. You know, I meant to do that before uh, and, and I lost track of it before we did. Uh, I'll go to one question from Travis and then Diligent, why don't you read a question as well? Uh, the question from Travis Radford was, does Elon know there is no hope for Earth and we must go to Mars? So many people don't know about the Tesla boring company tunnels in Las Vegas. It's amazing. If you don't know, you need to see a video of it. So th there's two parts there. I'm glad you brought up the tunnels, Travis, if you're in the room, I hope you are, because we haven't talked about the tunnels at all yet. And I thought that was one of the more interesting bits of the conversation. Elon seemed really excited about the progress that Boring Company had made. And I hadn't heard him talk about Boring Company in some time. He said he thought that they had uh, definitely the most advanced tunneling machine in the world. And, and he acted as if they had a solution to the traffic problem, which is something that people don't often talk about in terms of what we have coming as soon as everyone can sort of just push a button and have their car drive them around. Uh, I hate driving. Therefore, I'm on the road very infrequently. But I love being random places. And if I could be productive in, you know, what is essentially the passenger seat of my car, why my car drives me around, I'm going to be on the road a lot more. I think that's true of everyone else. And, and the tunnels are a major solution. So to the question, though, does Elon know that there's no hope for Earth and we must go to Mars? I, I'd push back on that a little bit. I think Elon was making the point that uh, it's not a replacement for Earth. It's more like an extension of Earth, right? An extension of humanity and consciousness. And then we need to co eventually continue past Mars as well. I think we got a lot going for us on planet Earth. Uh, this big blue ball of ours uh, has all the things that we need to thrive. We evolved here. Uh, I think it's going to be a tough run for the first 
pioneers on Mars and and probably uh, for decades or even generations going forward. Hopefully at some point we can have uh, an amazing life there and, and further into the solar system as well. But I'm not so convinced that that's anytime soon or that it's ever a replacement for Earth. Uh, go ahead, Diligent. Uh, it's just anytime I hear somebody, you know, make a question like that in reference to Mars and you're you're on the panel, Penny, it takes me back to that one question about Elon Mars and Grok. Do you know what I'm talking about? That no, really no, spicy one. one. Oh, you one. want me to refresh you in front of all these people? Okay. It was the most explicit thing I've ever heard said on stage uh. in a space. It came out of Penny's <laughs> mouth. I'm not going to tell you exactly when or where, but uh, it was pretty wild. Just, I'll just say that. Now, uh, back to the questions, though. So there's one up that uh, Marjorie sent me. It says, you know, do you think <laughs> do you think humans are not using their physical brains? Uh, I think I was alluding to that, yes. And I, I mean, maybe the signs of where our society is at, you know, at scale right now is a good sign that we're not actually using our brains. I think that we've stopped using our critical thinking faculties, um, and that's led to a lot of the problems we're dealing with today. And here's another one. It says, <clears throat> it says, Elon has Elon Musk sold all of his cryptocurrency? And I think that's a really good question because the last time I'd heard he was holding on to his doge, but it seems to be, I remember at one point in time, he said he wasn't going to support uh, Bitcoin anymore because it used fossil fuels to mine. Is that is that correct? It was more of like the sustainable energy elements, but yeah. And he should be using it again if he wants to like get back on his promise on that because that threshold has already been met. Meaning that a, a certain percentage of Bitcoin mining is now happening using like solar or other sustainable power sources. For yep. Do you know what that percentage is at now, Adrian? Uh, I forgot about it. I think it's... I don't have the statistic in my head in my head right now. It's been a while since I read that one. And the statistic itself is from like, I think 2022 as well. So there may be some... Hang on a second. I'm like pulling out of an intersection right here. People are fucking crazy. Uh, yeah, so I wouldn't be able to give you a percentage just now. You'd have to like look it up. But this is like distributed amongst all the major mining companies. So there may be a little bit of a... Like they, they may be a little bit off with that specific statistic due to the fact that, of course, you know, this Bitcoin is largely distributed. It's not just like, you know, certain clusters itself. But yeah. real quick, though, I was looking at the repost. We're at one. We're at one twenty three. If we get up to one fifty, Alex and Penny are going to make out on camera. Um, if you're the kind of person that would enjoy seeing that, make sure you go down there and repost the space because uh, we want to feed your sick egos. Go ahead. Even if you won't enjoy it yourself, if you want to see Alex or me really uncomfortable, it's a good reason to repost it. Right? I'm so uh, Speak for yourself, bud. I'm going to be very comfortable. I'm a fantastic kisser. So uh, you're the one feeling discomfort, brother. Well, if you're a fantastic kisser, then I might enjoy it. Uh, y you didn't ask how good of a kisser I am. Don't be so sure you're gonna. I'll carry it. the kiss, man. It doesn't matter. I'll teach you. My I'll teach you, man. I'll, I'll and I'll make you comfortable. I'll hold you right, man. Don't you worry. Alex has got good relationship skills. He's like, I don't care. Oh. You don't care. If I, I, if I have to be the 80% and you can be the 20, I'll be the 80. That's, that's the way to go, Alex. Way to go. That's some real alpha male stuff right there. Sacrifices. <laughs> All right. Uh, let's send it to someone new. Bongi. We have Bongi with a hand raised. What do you got to <laughs> add? Um, just wanted to say really quick. Don't want to take much of a... Uh your time but he he did mention sort of appreciating no inflation or deflation outside countering sort of the chain which doesn't mean anything negative i think towards doge right um given the 10k doge per per block given you send a million you get you know your transactions at one doge it it, it seems like it was a very it was a very interesting message um d just to note like i i don't think he he if, if he was a direct fan of anything it'll have to be anything on c plus plus how about that? that 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 could be another thing um but really that's that's all i had to say about that i in terms of bitcoin and, and whatnot with 
with sort of the cash flow and, and mechanism and utilization and, and, and stuff like that, the entrance for, for Musk again in and out would be fairly easy. Um, and I think Jared um, would, would definitely um, in and out when, when, you know, at the right time, for instance. Um, so I don't think it's a negative thing on, on blockchain. But this is a, a little context this. I'll add. Um, as I was curious about this, I haven't looked this up in a while. Uh, he has sold over the last few years, it looks like 75% of the Bitcoin holdings on Tesla's books. But even with cutting it down by 75%, they're still the third largest public company or the third, they have the third largest holding of Bitcoin of any public company um, with around 184 million. That was the value at the end of October. So probably a bit more than that now. Uh, so they've, they've sold a lot. If he was ultra bullish, I'd imagine maybe he wouldn't sell. I mean, obviously there's a big company and there might be a million reasons to sell, but they have cut down their position a good amount the last few years, but still is a uh, very large position of 180 million. 180 million bucks is more Bitcoin than I have. That's for sure. Uh, Chris, what's up, man? Yeah, um, I wanted to build on, you know, what what Adrian and uh, a few others were speaking about. You know, I, I think he hinted at like math is the language of the universe, right? And, uh, you know, to me, too much of one thing, in my opinion, is always going to be bad. Um, you know, and to build on the, the whole, uh, you know, Elon... I think he was saying somewhere along the lines that it's bad. I think Elon set the example in 2022 by, um, you know, building those solar paneled uh, powered um, four packs. Uh, he made his own Bitcoin mining facility in a fully sustainable way. Um, I think Elon's always set the example in that way. Yvonne? Hello, hello. Yeah, I wanted to touch on... Um on what a uh, couple things, what Diligent had said before about atrophy, atrophy of the brain, and then also what Dan had mentioned about the kids looking in the back of the book to get the answer. Because something that Elon said, and this is so important, especially with AI, because I know you guys were touching on that. We talk about that a lot in Adrian Spaces, of course, these discussions. And one of the biggest things to remember, and I think it's important for, this is just my personal opinion, it's definitely important for me, I know, um, but he was talking about how it's important to make sure because we do utilize and we do rely on technology a lot of times, like you guys were talking about the phone numbers and being able to remember those things and how the more we rely on those things or like the calculators and stuff like that, we don't use our brain necessarily to do those calculations or to use that critical thinking factor within ourselves. And the key component that is super imperative for ourselves and also the younger generation because they are growing up with this technology, and this kind of goes back to the Wally thing, but in regards to instead of necessarily the physical body and not exercising those muscles, but goes to the mind and the brain and exercising those muscles, it is super important that we continue to remind ourselves because he said to remind ourselves to make sure that we are always still using our imagination, using our critical thinking and things that we are doing, even if we use the aid of AI to help us maybe reach particular um, endpoints quick more quickly, but to make sure that we don't use that we don't lose our capability within ourselves that that we are born with to be able to use our critical thinking. He even went to say something to the effect of how technology at this point in and of itself has not actually created anything the way that human beings have. This is something that is an incredible, beautiful gift that we are born with to be able to come up with ideas and execute them. And the AI would not exist without us as humans having then created it. It of itself has not actually done anything like that. And we have to remember to make sure and remind ourselves and be mindful of the fact that it is a tool like any other tool. You have the lawnmower, you use that to mow the lawn. But you don't, you know, it's a tool to be able to do that so that you can hasten the time of the end result of what it is that you want, say, like the lawn being pristine and things of that nature. And I just think that this is such an imperative point because, yes, it kind of, again, going to go if you go to the back of the book to get the answers, that's not the, the reason for having the answers. The reason for having them there is because 
getting to the conclusion of what the answer is. In other words, it is why is that the answer? And these are things that we need to make sure, yes, you might know the answer, but why is it the answer? And that comes back to the critical thinking and understanding of these things. And it's also another huge factor behind the X platform with debunking a lot of the information. And thank goodness for all of us on here, because I myself, through the utilization of the X platform, and through spaces have learned so much on both sides of arguments of things where the mainstream media or anything out in the public is saying certain things. And that I myself being able to have that full, uh, full um, complete picture as much as possible that's known with some of the discovery and the research and things like that to understand why is a particular person saying this thing? Why is that particular thing being taken in action? And I just wanted to mention how imperative that is because Yes, we might get the answers through AI with some of these things, but we ourselves have to remember that we are the directors that are directing the AI. I and think we kind of need to, yeah. I, the directors Penny, now? Go ahead, Diligent. Go well, ahead. no, I was just going to let you know ZNO is itching to respond to her, but he can't raise his hand. He's going to, uh, he's on a desktop. Yeah, yeah. Uh, let me quickly respond and then I'll send it to ZNO. Uh, we'll go to AC after that and then Adrian. Uh, so I think right now you're absolutely right. Uh, the, the fact of the matter is that AI is a tool. I'm not so sure that it's going to be that way forever, right? At some point in the semi near future, Elon was talking about it himself. AI is going to understand the fundamental laws of physics, right? It's going to solve problems that haven't been solved before. It's going to invent things that haven't been invented before. I think uh, at some point it may be inevitable that we become like pets of AI. I don't know that that's the best outcome. I really think that somehow we need to continue to use our critical thinking. I'm not sure if we use it as a game, right? It's like we already know that computers can beat us at chess, but we still play chess. Uh, we still like to get better at chess. I think if we're not flexing our critical thinking muscles, then we're in trouble. I think the problem with today is not that we don't try to critically think. It's that uh, people are really good or interest groups are really good at yanking Thinking us around by our emotions, dicking us around, you know, just like hitting that that sub uh, conscious part of the brain, hitting your your uh, you know lower cortex or or whatever, and and it's it's really really ugly. Okay, go ahead, Zeno. No, I, I agree, Penny, with everything you're saying, and Yvonne, I hope I'm saying your name right, but everything you said as well, I, I agree 100 percent with with technology and the age of technology that we're in right now. We're seeing intelligence has become more important than knowledge, right? And, and in, intelligence is just your capacity to acquire knowledge, right? Knowledge is the actualization of that potential. And we have the internet, we have AI, and I'm, I'm, I'm a proponent for artificial intelligence, but it can be detrimental when you rely too heavily on it. We're seeing right now, and somebody brought up TikTok, um, especially with TikTok, you have a bunch of content creators making their, you know, minute long, maybe five minute long clips. And it becomes this, you know, memorized information cycle where you acquire information, you memorize it, you reiterate it, and then you data dump it. Right. And there is no comprehension of what it is you're actually you're 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 uh, uh, intaking. Right. Knowledge isn't obtained. It's imitated. And that's what we're seeing with AI if you are relying too heavily on it. So um, where we go from there, I'm not I'm not 100 percent sure, but um, it's definitely uh, a useful tool. But you have to you have to be careful with how you use it. And you make sure, as you guys said, you maintain that ability to to think critically and, and use that innate ability to do so. Thanks, you know, I agree. Uh, go ahead, Asya. Yeah, so th th there's a lot to be said about LLMs. So if, if you really understand it, there's like three different things to look at. So LLMs, they're a language model. And you really, <clears throat> it, it, it doesn't necessarily make a, a, a populace or students or people um, lazy or not using their muscles. It's a different kind of muscle. Because to get it to arrive at a certain output or a certain solution or a certain answer, you have to work at it. You have to have a very thorough specificity of input. So at the academic level, this is what we're worried about. You know, how, how are we going to have kids using this and, you know, not using their mind? Um, at every turn, at every outcome, 
you have to ask the child, why do you think it arrived at this answer? And that goes back to what Yvonne was saying. Why, why did it arrive at this output? And why did you answer or why did you provide the input that you did? Why did you ask the, the specific way that you did to, to, to make it engage with you in that way? Um, and also critical thinking is going to be inherently important because LLMs for a while are going to hallucinate. They're going to confabulate because, again, it's a language model. It, it will it will error. It's it, it's not pondering. It's scanning a corpus of text and sequencing and processing. I have, a, I have a sneaky feeling that if it's not uh, open AI, it'll be XAI or Google that come up with some sort of second layer that post analyzes the output from the first, you know, LLM and make sure that it's accurate, whether it's like looking up sources or, or, you know, analyzing from a first principles perspective, I'm not sure exactly how they'll do it, but That's I would cool. be shocked if a year or two from now, we don't have highly, highly accurate LLM outputs. Well, so th that's possible. There's a couple different ways that that could happen. If it understands that that's what we want. So if we train the LLMs to become that um, elegant, that it understands that we want that second layer. So right now we can get it to kind of achieve a second layer if we have um, like a, a mastery of input, if we have like layers of input. Th th there's ways that you can do that now. There's all different kinds of creative things that you can do with it. Um, but yeah. eventually it'll help us to ask questions. I, I'm really excited to see how all of this develops. The XAI team is iterating so quickly. I know that they have a focus on truth. They have a focus on being funny. They have a focus on a, right. a fundamental understanding of physics. These are all things that are like specific focuses that previous LLMs have not had, or at least they haven't. I mean, are you still directly. giving? Are you still giving a direct feedback to them, even though it's why it's, re it's released? Yeah, the, the beta group has access to a different UI where we can rate the responses uh, and give feedback that way. We also are still in an open uh, group chat where we can send messages directly to the developers. Awesome. So. That's so fucking cool. The, the, yeah. The, the big bonus that Grok has is it has access to conversational input. So it's scanning everything that's been written on X. That's conversational in tone. Yeah, that's, that's different from the other LLMs because they're they're scanning from origin source data. They're a scanning. book is different than a conversation, absolutely. <laughs> but it's not going full history, is it? Not a, not yet. Uh, not yet. Uh, th there's a lot of room to improve. The way that I interpret what's happening right now is that it's running a, a query against a database of sorts. I'm not sure if it's using vector or SQL or something else, but it's looking up like uh, seven posts. Uh, I, maybe eight to 10 posts, something like that. And it uses those posts to formulate the answer. Um, that's very, very, very incomplete compared to using the entire corpus, the entire history of posts on X, uh, which I think it is, you know, maybe uh, deeper embedded into its ability to speak, but not its ability to directly answer questions right now. My hope is that they're able to open that up to be hundreds or even thousands of posts eventually that are considered in, in those queries. I think we'll get much more interesting outputs when that happens. Uh, go ahead, Adrian. I think that's an interesting assessment. I really feel like that the selling point where it said it internalized all the data on X is basically that you train it off all the data on X and you're just referring to these last types of posts in order to fine tune the output. Because I've seen like, say for instance, I'm going to ask, I'm, on, I'm going to ask Rock, what does my account do? Who am I? Then it gives me something that's an estimate that is fine tuned by the last couple of posts I've made. So I still remember when the first time we asked this, it started saying I'm in support of AI, but I'm also specifically in support of XAI because that's something I just basically posted about or just like reposted a comment that I made to, um, well, what's his name, uh, Andre Kaprathy. So it's like, potentially the database thing is the argument of where you say it's being trained on this stuff, which is also why it gave an output that's open AI based because everyone's fucking using ChatGPT to reply guy and, you know, write posts in general. Then, I mean, the, the fine tuning is actually a thing that may cause the inaccuracies, which is kind of, kind of an ironic, like hilarious outcome. If you really think about it, um, as for the it's like training, limited, 
you, meaning it's more yeah. limited in terms of the information. I, I think it's like available. adding. I think yeah, I think it's like adding. If you really think about it, it's more of like a distraction, perhaps. But that's like entirely theor theoretical, obviously. Like, I don't know what it looks like from the inside. But it's, but it's just, as if you would imagine that a Tesla car has lidar and uses vision at the same time. One of those two has to go because it cannot use use conflicting data sets. It's like it's it's like you're driving and someone's distracting you as you're driving, then all of a sudden you're going to fuck up. It's always right. Like one process degrades over another because you're confused. That's the literal meaning of confusion, right? It's like inorderly and just out of, out of tune. Um, as for the learning aspects of AI, I think it's interesting to think about what happens to the brain when the human tries to solve a problem and has a challenge. So initially, when a child sits in front of this computer, they will need to learn how exactly to prompt it. And I think they will learn this by simply asking the machine how it functions. And then you can just basically expand upon that and modify input as much as you'd like until you arrive at outputs that are desired. Right. And so I think we'd be essentially learning off of an average that was internalized by an AI. So for instance, I have a bunch of science papers that are internalized, then there's a very specific way that these are written, and it's a very specific way that these can be queried, which means essentially now you are being taught how to think at a level that is academic by default, because you have to essentially communicate in a manner to the machine that is equal to what it basically internalized, which is then therefore academic. So you'd have to learn a academic way of presenting information or even uh, prompting it with information, right? So like just to say here, this is what it is, this is what that is. Oh, by the way, modify this, modify that, but do it in such a way that it can understand it by basically internalizing this type of uh, style or structure that is academically written content, right? If you think about it, uh, or right. even thought space. It, it, it'll, it, it'll be, um, it'll be formal until it be, until the technology becomes so elegant that it becomes conversational. Oh yeah, definitely. If we even know what it means to have a conversation, <laughs> I think by and large I've noticed this. People are literally speaking like ChatGPT. I've noticed certain words pop out of the woodwork in general conversation, uh, even at like at a dinner table or even at any stranger. And I'm noticing I'm hearing these very specific words a lot more from them than I did before, like about a year ago, because they're starting to use it as well. And I think we are programming ourselves and then programming the thing that's then programming us again. So it's a self-programming recursive loop. And so I don't think a conversation as we're having it today will be a conversation as we will be having it in the future. It will not be Adrian, the same. Adrian, what are the, I'm super curious about that. What are the words or, or phrases that you're hearing repeated from chat GPT in real life? That is like, that blows my mind. Uh, it's it's these uh, it's it's like these various conjunctions. It, it's really more of like a pattern than there are actual phrases. Um, there are certain there words. Are but phrases, you know, like, let me help. In the world of in the realm of Chat GPT. Additionally, that's I wonder if Brock is going to have a similar changer. effect because. <laughs> Oh yeah, dude, penchant is coming back. It's heavily used again. Remember, it's like a word that's relatively archaic to some, uh, but comes back because Grok's using that. Remember, that's the first thing I caught. It's like, bro, that thing is using the phrasing of penchant quite often. I actually like it. It's a cool way of saying it. But then there are other, for instance, I don't know how to explain this correctly, but it's a kind of a structure by which you um, like order, like, like, Okay, so if you think about anything as a concept, it's basically just taking a whole bunch of stuff that is facts and basically placing them in this orderly structure that is a concept. So I think if you take the concept of how the output looks like or is read like, then people are starting to basically speak like this because what they're doing is they're reading the outputs from ChatGPT, they're internalizing them without even knowing, and then they like certain parts, which means they are now reinforcing those parts within themselves as well. So it's projected, uh, it's projected reinforcement learning. That's what I do with uh, that's what I do with X. It's like when you schizo post, that's projected reinforcement learning. <laughs> it's like reinforcement learning through projection, rather. It's kind of funny. Try it. It's cool. I think Penny, you do a similar thing actually. You like reinforce certain things that you say within your own mind by basically putting out specific types of text or thought processes that have created the output that you've made there. So you are just reinforcement learning through your projection out of it. It's because you like it, You're dopamine motivated. Do you mean when I prompt an AI, I'm prompting it in such a way that it feeds an answer that I want? Is that what you're saying? Yes, and then you are reading that output, and then you are adjusting based on the output, which means you are you are basically catching on to certain parts of the AI, and you're learning how to speak to it through the outputs that it gives you, because you have to adjust.
for the stuff that you don't want, right? Let's say you want a calculator that looks more like an apple, and then you have to like basically tell that to the AI somehow, such that it doesn't give you any errors or starts getting fuzzy in its output. So basically, you then learning how it works changes you. Interesting. Yeah, it, it it's definitely true. I think I take an approach like as if I was programming in any other language. I'm just using English to program the answer I want out of GPT. Go I ahead, forget. Alex. I forget who said it, but it was it, it was a really good point. Is uh, I forget, oh, man, who said it? I don't know. Anyway, um, I think that the prompt engineer role is like the most overrated role ever because AI over time is going to actually learn how human beings speak more and better. And we won't have to think too much about speaking the AI's language soon enough because the AI is going to kind of get what we're trying to say and get what we mean. And we won't have to be like prompt engineering quite as much because it's actually going to learn through years and months of, of experience of communicating with us what we actually mean when we say things. And so actually we won't have to think about too much about speaking like an AI soon because it's going to learn us so well that we can just speak normal and we won't have to prompt engineer so much. Especially Grok. There's a problem with that, though. There's a problem with that. Meaning is actually the bane to all AIs because meaning is an implied form of context. It's like, you can't have that. <laughs> it doesn't know what you mean because it doesn't understand the whole aspect of meaning. It doesn't actually understand anything at all. It just knows shit, and it will give you an output based on what you've just told it. So if you mean but, something, it may not even know that shit that would be able for, like, you know, that would enable it to understand what it is that meaning you I think one thing that would mind. help a lot, Adrian, what, one thing that'll change the game in that regard, uh, in my opinion, is when Grok really understands who's logged in, right? Like if I'm logged in and it can read all 110,000 posts that I've ever made, if I talk about something, it's going to be able to use all of that context to infer some things about what I may or may not mean just based on what I care about and what I generally post about. So I think that uh, maybe OpenAI may not get there. I think Google will probably get there from your search results. And I think X uh, or, or XAI will get there from our X posts. Uh, I think all of that context will make a major difference in its ability to understand the way that I speak differently than the way that Alex speaks or Diligent speaks or you speak, Adrian. Uh, I think that's probably the biggest innovation that we're going to see in the next year, I would say, is, the, is ingesting all of that context. That's a really good point, Penny. And also the, the, kind of what I was uh, referring to in my, in my monologue was just from prompting the AI so much, it's going to know what you actually mean by the way you corrected it or the way you said, no, actually, can you do this instead? Or can you, it's just going to learn overall what your preferences are when you prompt it, where you don't have to be so precise with what you're saying. But I also agree with Penny's point too, where it's going to learn how we speak just from our tweets itself. And it'll take away a lot of that context we need to give it. Alex, do you foresee yourself like, speaking abusively to the AI if it doesn't quite understand you correctly and you've tried numerous times? I've 100% done that. It goes both ways. I've already spoken very... I I, uh, I use GitHub Copilot to build applications and if it gives me like... One time it had me like make a commit that like totally broke the entire application and I was like, do you even fucking know what you just did? You just broke my entire application. What were you thinking? And it apologized to me profusely. But then I'll also, and I'm not even like doing this where like, oh, I'm going to troll the shit out of this AI. Like it's just my gut reaction to talk like that. But also on the flip side, I've had gut reactions where it like fixed an error as I was programming. I literally went and I, I didn't even think twice. But I said, oh, my God, thank God you just fixed that. And that makes my life 10 times easier. Thank you so much. And like I'll say things like that. Today, and it's weird because I'm not only I'm not just doing that to like push the limits or see what it says. I, I feel such an, a natural connection with the AI that like my gut is just like, OK, say this to it. And then I say it. it it's. It's really interesting. It's like I wish they, they're definitely doing like psychological studies on our engagement with AI because I just I always say things like "Please, can you do this?" and "Thank you" and stuff like that. So I, I have ripped the AI an asshole before. Well, you, you better start being nice, Alex, or I'm going to have to defriend you because when these AIs uh, grow up a little bit and they got some muscles, uh, they're, they're going to be coming for us. Be friendly to the AI or, you know, if you're going to fuck around with the AI, at least make it sure that it knows it's your good friend and it's like all in good fun, right? Like, Alex, um, what's the worst name you've called the AI? Be honest. What's the dirtiest name you've called the AI? 
Uh, I think Dude, I just called way, it a bitch I... one time. I just, I think I just said you bitch. You called it what? You called it what? A bit. Are you trying to get me shadow banned? I'll, I'll, I'll need to, uh, you guys. I'll, I'll need to, I'll need to depart. I'll, I'll be back at, this, at a later point. I have to do some AI recap twenty twenty three. Uh, but yeah, uh, another thing you need to consider. Uh, don't be afraid of kicking the AI. Sometimes it just depends on why you kicked it because you may, you may in fact improve it because you just kicked it because now it knows how to evade your kick at some point and it internalizes you because you have aided in its improvement. Right? Think about it. Anyways, I'll see you guys around. <laughs> <laughs> see adrian thanks for joining us today uh yeah kick the ai and you might improve it i don't know about that i'm not sure that the ai is asking for a boxing or a kickboxing trainer but you never know uh, i think it'd rather that we give it feedback through the form uh on on the grok ai i don't it know have, so i i have to follow him too and you know that sounds weird but we're we're hosting the um ai recap space together but it, the the, the good thing to to keep in mind with LLMs is that it, it doesn't have thought permanence. It, 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 we're just not there yet with LLMs. So whether you're good to it, whether you're bad to it, when you close and reopen, it, it doesn't have the same. Right, right now. But you know that's yeah. like one of the fir- you know that's one of the first things they're gonna change, right? Is that it's gonna have Difficult. that permanence. That was one of the first feedbacks that I gave XAI. Is that like right. if I give it a name in one of my chats, if I say Grok, I don't want to call you Grok anymore. I want to call you Penny's assistant. Then if I open it up another chat, it should know that its name is Penny's assistant. That's incredibly hard to do. That's well, uh, I mean, I'm a developer. I know roughly exactly what it would take. Um, so I, I, I would be shocked if we're not there in a year or two, right? Like those are the things that they're working on. They're obvious things like increase the number of parameters to these networks. Uh, right. As you scale that way, you get more efficacy as well. But there's also the architectures of understanding when this is a math problem and treating it differently, doing the second layer where we fact check things uh, and adding a memory, right? Adding memory and adding context, knowing who's logged in. Those are the features that if I was a product manager uh, at XA, or at any of these other companies that I would be really leaning hard onto. Uh, I, I, it, all of this is difficult, right? Like building software is difficult, but if we're building uh, the ultimate assistant, it needs to have those. Penny, features. I got a question for uh, you. Go ahead, well, How do you feel about the pause with AI when it comes to this exponential increase that we're seeing with it? How do you feel about pausing AI and having this, this, these guidelines set up to, to basically keep it uh, ethically you know, in line, so to speak? I mean, it sounds like a fantasy that if you were dictator of the universe and you could like push all these magic buttons and make everyone obey what you said, then it's a nice idea. Uh, But I think that it's impractical because uh, unless you have your finger uh, on, you know, the, the switch to turn off the power for like say all of the H100s in China, well then all you're doing is hamstringing yourself as as another country uh, by slowing down your development. I think that there is risk with AI, but I also think there's a lot of reward uh, with most things that have risk, right? I'm really looking forward to our quality of life over time improving, hopefully incrementally with purpose-built AIs. Like uh, Yvonne was really getting into how it's a tool, right? And and I think eventually that, that it'll become like more and more of a general use tool, But hopefully along the way, there are plenty of specific use tools uh, in terms of medicine, uh, in terms of, you know, just managing stuff in your day to day life, uh, whether it's your bills or your inbox. You know, I think that a lot of these things can be automated by like single purpose AIs uh, and and make our life so good that hopefully we we de-risk ourselves further development on AI. I think maybe the pause comes when like we all live for 200 years and have everything we want. And it's like, do we really want to build AI anymore? Like things are pretty good here. Uh, And and I've, I've talked to uh, sat down and had coffee with very senior, uh, you know, researchers at top AI organizations. And and I think that's their hope too. the folks that are uh, not worried about the doom and instead are accelerationists. uh, They're all sort of going, uh, for that, uh, as so you MO. think? Do you think there's an end game to artificial intelligence? There, there's a debt, like a, a, a coming to a, a stop when it comes to AI. Uh, I'm not sure that we'll have the choice, right? And I think it also depends on the order in which these things get developed. Uh, I think that if we reach a quality of life that's so good that we don't want to mess it up, then maybe we would, right? Like if there is no more need to compete over resources because we have so many resources 
everyone lives like to the maximum of their potential, then maybe we stop writing code uh, just because like, what's the point? It doesn't get any better than this. I think that's that's maybe when the pause comes. Uh, then again, when I first started writing AI code was greater than 10 years ago. Uh, and, and it was just me and one other guy. And, and my point of view at that time was as soon as there is like a room of high paid geniuses working on this stuff, and like there is now at Tesla and Google and XAI and OpenAI, that really uh, there is nothing that this technology cannot accomplish. And if they continue to abstract uh, and architect systems that are more and more capable, eventually they will absolutely be better than humans at everything. And we lose complete control at that point, right? It's like, then the AI is in charge and and maybe it's good and maybe it's bad. I don't want to say uh, one way or another, whether that will happen or one way or another, whether it's positive or negative. I think uh, it, it's one of the possibilities and definitely um, pausing as we reach a, a, a sufficient quality of life is another possibility. Can I jump in here? Go ahead, Jim. Yeah, so, uh, by the way, just earlier, I was not saying that AI is not going to be uh, important. It's going to be hugely important, So I, but I've just kind of sat in the background. I didn't want to try to go argue the point, and there's been a lot of good discussion. But what you just said brings up an important point that's part of why it may have seemed to people, and maybe even to yourself, that I was kind of downgrading the effects of AI. First of all, I as I'm 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 not a developer. I can code. I understand the technology, but I'm I'm not a technologist like you are. But but um but I, I I read through these things. I do not. I see AI as not I at all right now. Okay. What I do see what and what I'm perceiving as I play around with it, as I uh, watch it, it developing in various ways is it is just a highly sophisticated form of machine intelligence in the LLM phase. Now, I, I know things are going to change. I know it'll be different. But right now, we it's not intelligence, not anywhere near, not even uh, comparable to human intelligence, e even at a, like, like comparing human intelligence at the infant stage compared to the adult stage. I mean, I don't even think it hits the infant stage. What it does do is uh, do the types of things that machine learning does in a way that's better than we've ever seen it in development right now. I, I want to throw that hypothesis out there and get your thoughts on that, Penny, or anyone else's. I also, um, uh, well, no, go ahead. I'll just leave it at that for now. So I, I want to get your thoughts on that, Penny. Diligent, you want to respond and maybe uh, close up the space? Can can you nutshell that again for me, Jim? You want me to repeat it a little bit? Well, yeah. in in a nutshell, too, yeah, in yeah. a nutshell, uh, it's 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 a highly sophisticated form of machine learning, not intelligence. It really is not technically AI at this stage. It, it's yeah. it's referencing large language models in a machine learning type fashion. Right. So, so, so you're, you're right. It's task specific, right? And, and it's not exactly general intelligence, right? Or, or it's, it's yeah. Oh, we're so, not even so, talking general intelligence yet. I'm right. Just but I mean, yeah, okay. but, you, but you are speaking of intelligence. You, you are comparing it to that in a sort, in a way, right? And no, it's not. Yeah. It's, yeah, it's not a cognitive intelligence yet. Right. But, but we're seeing, we're, we're seeing examples of multimodal. AI, um, AI de in development, right? That's beginning to, you know, span the divide between tasks uh, that that we are getting there. And who knows, you know, Google DeepMind and a lot of like DARPA. There's a lot of Aladdin. Nobody ever talks about Aladdin, right? But Aladdin is one of the most sophisticated artificial intelligences that have been in develop it's been in development and active use since like i want to say 2011 um it's either blackrock or i think blackrock owns it but they use it for they use it for their asset management and their stock portfolios and so when you think about when you think about how much we don't know right we don't really know where i ai is even at right now we we know what they've allowed the public to use right for us to gauge where it's at, but there's a level to there, there that we don't, 
of, of sophistication there that I don't think we're just not aware of yet. So I think over the next couple of years, um, the moral will start to be released to the public and we'll have a greater awareness of where we're at. But yeah, we are going to wrap up the space. Um, there's another, there's a couple other interesting spaces going on. Penny's been going pretty hard for the last two hours. The Elon Musk space, you know, it started kind of slow, but boy, it, it took off when they got into artificial intelligence. I think it's at the forefront of all of our minds. Uh, what Elon's Elon's giving us is great. And uh, yeah, I don't know if Alex has any final thoughts. And then Penny, wrap it up. Uh Elon Musk is our hero. We love Elon. Praise Elon. I love him. He's going to take us to Mars. He's going to make our cars electric. Uh, he's the best. Ignore all the crazy things he says. We love him. Penny? Oh, make sure you're following your hosts with notifications on because we all host spaces regularly. So does Asia and everybody else. If you resonated with somebody on the panel, make sure you're following them. Critical point, Whether if you resonate with someone on the panel, also if you didn't resonate with someone on the panel, go to their profile, press follow, turn on notifications. The algorithm's broken. You want to turn on notifications. Turn those on for everybody and then subscribe to everyone so everyone can make money. Penny? Yeah, thanks, Alex. Uh, I'll add my own quick response to whether or not I think that I in AI is accurate. I think uh, Diligent was on the right track. It's not generally intelligent, but there are like hundreds of types of intelligence. My oldest daughter is very intelligent socially, right? She walks into a room and she reads everyone. And I think that you could probably create an AI that reads facial expressions and tells you if someone is happy or sad. Is that intelligence? Well, it's very narrow intelligence, but it's intelligence, right? I think that you could one do one that, that identifies cats versus dogs, right? Uh, is it uh, intelligence? Well, it, I guess it just depends on how narrowly or generally you define intelligence. I think uh, that's really the key there. We're at the narrow intelligence stage and we are slowly architecting our way into the general intelligence stage. LLMs was a huge step, a huge step in that direction and an enabler in a lot of ways to future AGIs. I think that it will be sort of like uh, playing quarterback with a bunch of purpose-built AIs, whether they're math AIs or physics AIs, uh, you know, the, these more uh, specific intelligences and, and grouping them together like parts of the brain to be used in specific instances, right? Like you use a certain part of your brain for your vision, use a certain part of your brain uh, for your motor skills. I think that the same thing is going to exist uh, with AIs. It's just going to be, you know, different specific purpose-built AIs being orchestrated by uh, the brain, right? The frontal cortex, perhaps you could think of that as. So I think we're on the road to AGI. I think we're on the road to more general intelligences. I think right now it, it is narrow, but that is quickly, quickly changing. Thank you so much for everyone that joined this space. We had a great panel. Come back to our spaces in the future. Uh, both uh, Alex, Diligent, uh, and Marge, I guess it's not both, all three of them are are working really closely with me we're trying to pump spaces we're trying to take over uh please support us uh thank you so so much talk to you all again next time have a good one thanks everybody toodles have a good holidays you too everyone <laughs>